Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to help support the show by becoming a premium member, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash podcast to sign up. Memberships are only $2.99 a month. By becoming a premium member, you'll be able to download episodes onto your mobile device and listen to them commercial-free wherever you go. Also, if you'd like to check out the new Dogman Encounters t-shirt store, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash store and take a look around. Buying a t-shirt or sweatshirt there is another great way to help support the show. As always, thanks for listening. Alright, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest was on episodes 107 and 147. On episode 107, he talked about a strange structure he and his friend found behind his property that had what looked to be human remains in it. On episode 147, he talked about an encounter he had in 2016 while he was hunting, where a large dogman that looked like the werewolf from the movie Bad Moon seemed to be stalking him. Of course, I'm talking about Dave. Dave, welcome back to the show. Hi Vic, thanks for having me on again. Oh, thanks for coming back. You know, I appreciate it. Dave, for listeners who didn't hear the last show you came on and did, please tell them about yourself. Well, uh, I'm 26 years old. I live in Brazier Falls, New York. Uh, I currently work on the Akwesasne Mohawk Reservation. Um, a fisheries technician. I just got hired there last year. I did work two years before that as a forestry technician. I'm an avid outdoorsman. Uh, I love hunting, fishing. Nowadays, I'm mostly into fishing. I actually I didn't do too much hunting last year, but I'll usually try to get out maybe a couple weekends at a time. But other than being outdoors, uh, I will spend most of my time indoors if the weather's not permitting. Uh, I usually hang out with my roommate here because I'm actually living in my new apartment now. Uh, I'll either be watching football together or playing games. But that's pretty much it on me. Well, from talking with you, hearing about all the things you do and have been doing, there's no denying the fact that you stay busy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure sounds like it. Since you came on the show and told the listeners about your last encounter, you became a field investigator for the NADP. You became an investigator for the NADP before you had the two encounters we're going to talk about tonight, though. Playing the devil's advocate, were you ever conflicted about staying to interact with those dogmen instead of trying to get away from them? Don't get me wrong, I don't blame you at all for trying to get away from them, but, I mean, you ran away from creatures you were supposed to be investigating. Well, I mean, after my first encounter that I had back in 2016, that was fairly terrifying for me and never really got over it until almost a year later. And basically once that happened, I kind of started thinking about it. I was like, well, you know what, it's like I didn't have any issues with it. There was no physical confrontation. It didn't look like it was going to hurt me. I mean, I couldn't be sure about that because, like I said, in the encounter, its attention was drawn off of me by a bunch of grouse that flew out of the tree and basically drew its attention from what it was looking at me and then saw the birds and immediately thought, hey, there's another food source. So it went after them. So I started thinking about it. I was like, well, I kind of have a hot spot for him. So I figured... If I've seen it there once, maybe I'll see it there again. And of course, I started doing research online. Then I discovered that there was actually a group that investigated Dogman, which was the NADP, the North American Dogman Project. And I ended up going on their website, signing up. And I emailed David Jones. And of course, he talked to me about it. And of course... I don't think there's too many people in New York State that have seen Dogman. I know we have a representative here for New York State. So, of course, I decided I was going to be an investigator. I got signed on and been doing investigations from time to time if I can find anything that's interesting in a way or something that seems like it's dogman related. So, of course, I started going to the woodlot where I saw that dogman in 2016. And I would drive down the road some nights. I didn't really go during the day because I just didn't really think daytime was really a hot time to see him. And there was a lot of deer activity. And from my father being up there hunting, he didn't seem to have any issues. Usually the years where he doesn't shoot any deer, 
are the prime years I want to go down and check out the woods because when there's no deer activity, that usually means there's probably a predator in the area that might have scared off the deer. And this year, well, technically last year, it'd be this last fall when I went up there and was doing my nightly drives. This was after my August encounter, which we're going to get to. I decided that it would be a good time to check out the activity up there. And of course, there's plenty of weekends I'd go down there and I wouldn't see anything. And up until now, I haven't really seen too much or heard very much up there. But August was basically the prime time when I saw well, the one dog man that we're going to talk about. And, of course, the howl that I heard. And, of course, that was at the very tail end of August. So I think that possibly right there in the end of the summer, early fall is when they're starting to become a little bit more active up there. So I'm hoping that when springtime arrives, I can get back down onto that road because it's not really accessible during the winter. If the snow melts, you can drive down there. But if we get a huge downfall of snow, that's over two feet. Not even the best truck's going to make it down that road. Well, given your history, I'm sure it's just a short matter of time before you have your next encounter, especially considering the fact they seem to be so thick in that area. Oh, definitely. I'm sure that there must either be a family living there. There could even be two packs living there because including the property that my father owns, there's tons of farmland around there. Most of it's all wooded. There's large fields. But if you were to gather up the information on a map and see how much acreage there is between, say, the town of Herman and I'd say either Edwards or Governor in between the area, I mean, there's just thousands upon thousands of probably hundreds of thousands of acres of forest that people don't really go into. Yeah, sounds like it's perfect habitat for them, but why do you think you have so many run-ins with them? Um, primarily, I think I know because any predator, when they see something by itself, it's usually a good indication that they're going to try and eat it. But it's like well, when you talk about these encounters where people are by themselves and they see one. Some of these encounters, people get chased. And that might actually be a sign that the dog man is attempting to predate on that person or possibly eat them. I mean, because we do have a lot of the unknown animal attacks that a lot of episodes have covered. I know there's multiple episodes that they talk about missing hunter cases or people being attacked in their homes. So I think that when I go up there by myself... And the fact that the deer are all but pretty much unheard of in the area right now that you can't really drive up there and see them. Usually they're pretty common sometimes of the year, but not seeing them this year, I think that the dogmen might potentially be interested in another food source. And I mean, if there's a lone driver on the road, they might associate them with food. So when I go down there, I think they might be associating me with food if they deem it necessary because of this winter has been pretty nasty so i've never heard of it happening on coffee road but somebody that decides to get out of their vehicle if they had to use the bathroom after a night of drinking there's a potential that if they are around they might end up not returning back to their vehicle if you know what i mean so i think that's why the dogmen are kind of taking interest right now well when you're having these encounters that you have i sure hope they're not looking at you as a menu item that wouldn't be good Oh, definitely not. I don't think I'd want to end up getting torn apart by a pack of dogmen. (laughs) Yeah, I could think of a lot better ways to go than that. Having as many encounters with dogmen as you've had, does it ever seem like they must be hiding behind every tree for you? Well, it doesn't really seem like they're always around. I mean, when I'm back at my apartment, I got a lot of woods out back, but with the amount of houses and the amount of people that are back there all the time snowmobiling, It just gives, it's a sense of security. I don't think that anything would be back there because there's so much human activity. I don't think dogmen really want to be back there if someone's taking their snowmobile back there all the time and especially in large groups. I think they like their solitary areas where they don't have to worry about being bothered. I mean, I know they come in rural areas, even urban areas, but apart from that, I just don't think that there's much around here that they're interested in. But I think over in the Brazier State Forest where there's a lot more Woods and very few houses, I think, is where their interests are, uh, well, how should I say it? They're more keen on looking at a potential meal in that area or seeking out maybe potential pets that people have wandering around over in the woods because they just 
stand a better chance of not being seen by a large public group, like in a rural area where I am. Yeah, that would make sense. It would be the perfect area to support them. The two encounters you're going to tell us about tonight happened in the same area. Before we talk about those encounters, please tell us about that area. Well, the area where I had the encounters, like the one I had in 2016, this is actually the road that goes past my father's camp. It's called Coffee Road. It's spelt just like the drink. It's just outside of Herman, probably about four miles out of Herman, and it's also located near Trout Lake, which is just a small town, basically between Herman and Edwards. The road is about five or six miles long. Uh, it's just a dirt road, and it connects Trout Lake Road to Pond Road. And there are absolutely no fields down Coffee Road at all. It's all wooded area. There might be a couple openings in that where people have cut wood. But in terms of farmland in that, there's very, really old farmland that was all grown up years and years and years ago. So basically every single bit of land that you go through down that road is just completely all hardwoods or uh, some hemlocks and pines. Uh, it's not really accessible during the winter. Like I said before, if the weather warms up and it gets up to like 40 or 50 degrees and the snow melts, you can generally drive down the road. But as soon as we get a downpour of snow and you get over two feet, you'll get stuck down that road. And I don't think I'd want to drive down there during the night and end up getting stuck. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be good. All right, Dave, let's talk about the encounter you had last August. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Well, last August, of course, about halfway through the year when I was working, because I'm only seasonal right now. Of course, being a fisheries technician, I really started to get back into fishing. And, of course, my friend, you know, he's a big bullhead fisherman, so he told me about some spots. He's like, hey, we should go bullhead fishing one night. We'll take off right as it gets dark. We'll go try out some spots and see what we catch. So we decided to go down to my friend Corey's. He and his parents were living in Governor at the time. And we went down to his house. I brought all my fishing gear, and we waited for my friend Alex, and he finally came and picked us up that night. So we went to Herman, and... There's one spot in Herman that you can fish. I mean, you can go into town and fish, but we didn't really want to drive his loud truck into town and wake up everybody because there is a bridge that you can fish off of in town, but I don't know if it's really any good fishing right below the dam. So we went over to Pond Road, and there's a little bridge that goes across the creek there before you get into town. And we stopped the truck there. And as we were getting to the spot, we got hit by a nasty thunderstorm. So we had to sit and wait in the truck for a little while. And it just rained and rained and rained like crazy. So we finally got the chance to go out and fish. Uh, it was still raining a little bit, so went over onto the bridge, tossed our lines in. We were using three types of bait that night. Bullhead really liked to hit on hot dogs, chicken liver, and night crawlers. I was using a night crawler. He was using chicken liver. I think Corey was using a cut-up hot dog. But we didn't get too many bites. Corey caught a tiny little bullhead he was like four or five inches long but we still eat the small ones because you can just throw them in the fryer and then eat them whole after you've gutted them of course so i got kind of bored with that area and told him i'll ah, we'll go up pond road and hit up the uh, pond that's over near uh, coffee road so he decided that ah, well i actually think i got another spot i want to go check out so we drove down the road or down trout lake road and there was a tiny little creek it's like a little outlet to a big beaver swamp there just before you hit coffee road. And we threw our lines in there and we were there for maybe 10 or 15 minutes and we weren't even getting any nibbles. So we just pulled our lines up and decided we'll hit up coffee road. So we went over, uh, pulled off on the coffee road and we started driving down the road and we finally got to the hemlocks, which was right on the border of the area where I had that dogman encounter in 2016 when we were uh, coyote hunting. And once we got there, we started driving down the road. And of course, I just got this really uneasy feeling. It was just the night was super, super quiet. It was just really creepy, even over the sound of his truck. His truck was super loud, but even over his truck, you could still hear the crickets and the frogs. Because, I mean, there's just so many of them in the woods that when they made all their nightly sounds, I mean, you could literally be driven nuts by them. That's how loud they were. But. I got uneasy about it, and I just said, Alex, we should stop the truck for a second. I want to just take a listen. So, of course, he said, oh, yeah, sure, we'll stop. And, of course, we stopped the truck, and he turned it off. And 
we sat there for a little bit and I looked at him and he had an uneasy feeling on his face. And we talked a little bit. I was like, well, doesn't it seem like there's something in the area? Like it seems like there's something, you know, a predator in the area. It's just so quiet. Usually we'd hear the crickets and the frogs right now. And I'm surprised we haven't seen any deer. Because usually there's tons of deer sign in the area. And you usually see them crossing the road at night because they go into the hemlocks to bed. So he sat there talking about it. He's like, well, there might be coyotes in the area. And of course, when he said that, the look on his face is like, I don't think you think it's a coyote. So I started thinking about my encounter and I was like, it is a possibility that Dogman could be in this area and he could be watching us right now. So he started the truck back up and went down further onto Coffee Road. And I told him about the sluice pipe that's about halfway down Coffee Road. And there's a little beaver swamp there and the road literally goes right through it. So there's a sluice where the water has to go through. And we figured, ah, we'll try out some bullhead fishing. There. I don't think the water is too high, but we'll go try it out. So we drove down, and the entire time we were driving down there, it just felt like something was either following us or watching us as we were driving down the road. So we got to the sluice pipe, and just as we got down the hill, the animals, the crickets and the frogs, just they started acting up again, and you could hear them making all their nightly sounds. And it gave me a sense of security. I was like, oh, well, I think we're fine now. So we got out of the truck after sitting there for about five minutes seeing if the uh, mosquitoes are going to be all that bad, which they actually weren't too, too bad when we stopped. And just as we were getting out of the truck, the animals just went quiet all of a sudden again. So, yeah, and everything just went deathly quiet. And as we were sitting on the side of the truck, Alex had his door open, and I had my door open, and Corey was just getting out. And I looked at Alex, and he looked at me, and I was looking at him like, you just heard the frogs and the crickets. They are just making a ton of sounds just as we got here and all of a sudden they just stopped and of course he looked like he was getting a little bit white in his complexion it's like you don't look like you're feeling really keen on fishing here so i was like well we'll just check it out real quick so of course we're messing around with our fishing gear i got my stuff out we got all the lanterns turned on and Corey was first to get his line in the water and i went over i was going to cast in i made the stupid mistake of using my bait caster at night and when I cast it into the water, I ended up getting a really bad bird's nest because I wasn't paying attention. So I was messing around with that. And Corey caught one or two little tiny bullhead while I was messing around with it. And while I was messing around with that bird's nest, Alex was over at the truck and he just had this really uneasy look on his face like something was wrong. And of course, the animals were super quiet still. Nothing was making a single sound. And... I decided, ah, whatever, I'll use my other fishing pole. So I got my other fishing pole out of the back of the truck, and I went up to Alex and told him, I was like, I don't really think I want to be in this spot anymore because it's just really creepy. And he's like, yeah, I kind of got that uneasy feeling too. I just don't really want to, I don't want to be here. It's weird. It's, this seems like something's watching us. So, of course, we got Corey, and Corey's like, ah, yeah, I only caught a couple here anyway. The bites aren't really all that good. So he put our stuff into the back of the truck, and he threw the fish in the bucket. Started the truck up and started driving down Coffee Road again. We were making our way to the end of the road. And we started getting down the road a little bit more. And then you could finally hear the animals start kicking up again. You could hear the crickets and the frogs. So this weird feeling came over. You're like, I think whatever is back towards where we just were is following us. So that's a good sign that we should probably get going. We drove about another mile down the road and they were still loud as could be. And we got to the end of the road. And there's a little area where the fire department dumped a bunch of gravel and they pushed it over onto the grass and they filled their trucks right there next to the little bridge. And Pond Road's literally right there. It's basically just a, a Y the road wise off right there. You got Coffee Road that veers off into the forest and then Pond Road follows this large, I uh, how to say it. It's like a huge ridge line that follows the entire length of the road, but the bridge is right there and Right on the corner, there's a really, really deep spot for bullhead fishing. And a lot of people, I guess, fish. I don't know if they really hit it up anymore. I think we we're the only ones that actually fished there last year. I've rarely ever seen people there. But uh, we pulled the truck into that spot, and we got all of our gear out. And he chopped up some chicken liver and some hot dogs. And, of course, we had this pack of hot dogs that we left out the day before. left it out in the sun so they'd get all nasty and smelly. And I mean, you couldn't keep them in the cab of the truck. They stunk so bad. And the bullhead were absolutely hitting on them like crazy. So, of course, once we got all of our gear out of the truck, 
I noticed that there's still tons of sounds out in the woods. You can still hear the crickets and the frogs. And we went and set up. I got my tackle box out. And I got all my gear out that I needed. And I sat on top of my tackle box because it functions as a seat, too. So we threw our lines in. And I ended up hooking into a really nice bullhead, but I didn't tie my hook on correctly, which I kind of kicked myself in the butt for. I hooked into a large one, just got it up to the shore, and he got off the hook. Well, he took the hook with him. And I know he was a really good-sized bullhead because he bent the pole quite a bit. I even saw him splashing around in the water there before I got him up. And Corey and Alex were going nuts. They're like, oh, get him in, get him in, because they wanted to eat him. And I ended up losing him. But I redeemed myself later that night because I caught two decent sized ones that we ended up bringing back to cook. But, uh, it was fairly late that night when we actually got down to the fishing hole. It was about 1230. So of course we'd been there for about an hour and I didn't realize that the animals went quiet. So we sat there making conversation. And of course, once they all went quiet, I kind of got the hint that that thing, whatever was in the area that was scaring all the animals, must be either in the area or it's watching us right now. And of course, the moon was out that night. It was the night before the full moon. So it was really bright. But unfortunately, with all the rain that we were getting, it was really cloudy. So you'd have these moments where it would be really dark. And then the clouds would move and the moon would brighten up everything. And as we were sitting there, I just got this really eerie feeling that we were being watched. And I remember looking at Alex, and Alex had this really eerie feeling that we were being watched. So I talked to him about it, and he wasn't really, like, super shook up. He thought, well, there's probably coyotes, and they're probably watching us right now. And he said, well, we got some really nasty-smelling hot dogs, and it's probably wafted out into the woods, and they smelt it, and they probably want to eat it. And, of course, the smell of bullhead, too, because they actually pretty smelly fish when they're in the water for a long time. I talked to him about it and he didn't really think too much of it. So he just kept fishing and we didn't want to tell Corey because Corey, well, he's not a big fan of the dark and he's not a fan of the woods at night, sort of like me. And he scares pretty easily. So we didn't tell him. And of course I said, well, I'm going to go grab my drink out of the truck. If I figured we're going to stay here a little bit longer because I didn't really have any sense of danger. I was like, yeah, we'll keep fishing, catch our limit and then we'll leave. So of course I was going to the truck and that's when I noticed something coming down the road. Now, of course, it was really small, so I was like, well, it's not huge, but this cat came down Pond Road, and he walked over to me, and as he was walking to me, I noticed the cat was looking up onto the hill, and I'm pretty sure it was a stray because he didn't have a collar on him, and he looked like he was a wild cat. His hair was pretty roughed up, and he didn't smell very good. He was a friendly cat, but he was not fond of me. He just he wanted to stay away from me and Corey and Alex because he probably just didn't interact with humans very much. But he was looking up onto that hill, and as he was looking up onto the hill, I kind of got this feeling whatever is watching us is up on that hill. So the cat just kept looking up there, and then once I got my drink out of the truck, the cat obviously must have thought that there was food, but when I shut the door and the door closed, the cat went running up onto the hill because I scared the crap out of him. And no sooner than I closed that door and the cat went running, I was just starting to walk back to our fishing spot, and that cat came bounding down the hill. As soon as he went up there, he just came flying right back. And, I mean, he was moving like a bat out of hell. He did not want to be up in the woods on that hill. And he flew right past me. His tail was all fluffed out. And he ran over onto the bridge. And he sat down and was watching Alex and Corey. But that's when I noticed up on the hill, something was in the tree. And at first, I was thinking, the hell was up in the tree? And I saw what looked like the side of a head. And I saw an ear, and I could see eye shine, so I saw two eyes. But me being me, I assumed that it was a coyote. But that's when I realized when the clouds moved, the moon shone down onto the hill. And once it started lighting up the hillside, I realized that the hill, you could actually see the top of the hill through the trees. And then you can see that the trees that were up on top of the hill obviously were up above the ground line. And that's where that thing was up in the tree. You could see it clearly up at the very tip top up in the canopy. And that's when I realized, well, what is it? Maybe it's a raccoon. But when I said that, that's when I saw an arm. And the arm was sticking out of the side of the tree. And he had it embraced onto part of another branch. He was grabbing onto that. 
but I couldn't see the bottom half of his body. And then I could just see the head and I could see the ear and the eyes. So, of course, that immediately rang the bell in my head like, oh, my God, you know, I think that's a dog man. I was like, there's no way it's a person playing a joke on us. And a cat is not going to be scared of another person up in the woods. And why would a person climb a tree that tall? And there's no way you'd be able to climb it easily because there wasn't all that many branches on it. Most of the branches were way up in the canopy. And the tree itself was probably close to 60 feet tall. So, of course, the moon ended up getting obscured by clouds again. So I could just see the eye shine. That was it. And the only way I could see the eye shine is because when it was looking down at me, we had the lights from the lanterns, and you could also see the reflection from the moon in the water. So I think that's what was reflecting the eye shine of the dog man that was up in the tree. And I was trying to spot it out a little bit better, but I can only see his eyes because the moon was obstructed by the clouds. And I kind of backed up and went back over to my spot where I was fishing, grabbed my fishing pole, and I just sat there watching him. And I told Alex, I was like, I think there's something up in that tree watching us. And, of course, he looked up and he's like, it's probably just a coyote up on the hill. And I said, there's something up in the tree. And he's like, could be a raccoon. I said, it isn't a raccoon. And, of course, he's not much of a paranormal guy. He doesn't really believe in Dogman or Bigfoot. So he kind of ignored it. I mean, he still had the uneasy look on his face. And I told him, I was like, well, it's about time we start packing up and getting ready to leave here. And. We started getting our stuff together and I just kept my eye up on that tree and I was watching this dog man and like once in a while I'd see about half of his face poke around the tree up in the canopy, but the rest of his body was obscured because this is the end of the summer. So there's still a decent amount of leaves in the tree and they're still pretty green. So if you were going to see something up there, it would be really hard to spot even during the day. But we got our stuff together, didn't tell Corey, didn't want to freak him out. And I didn't want to tell Alex what I thought it was because I was like, well, I don't want to get laughed at. And I don't want him to think that I'm trying to scare those guys because this is about two o'clock in the morning when we're seeing this thing. And they got into the truck. And of course, once we were getting in, I looked up into the tree again and I could still see him poking around the side of the tree and I could see his ear kind of moving. He was adjusting his ear to catch whatever sounds we were making. You could see it twitching. And of course, you could see him blink his eye once in a while because, you know, you'd see the eye shine all of a sudden. It'd go dark and then he'd open his eye again. And I was getting really freaked out because I was thinking, well, this thing might be looking at us as potential food. And you never know, there might be another one. There could even be three or four more. So we got our fish, put them in the back, and we ended up leaving the hot dogs we were using because we weren't going to use them again. We were all done fishing for the weekend after that night. And the cat that I saw earlier was still sitting on the bridge. And, of course, I took the hot dogs and I left them on the bridge. It's like, ah, the cat might as well eat them. And, of course, when we got back to the truck, I closed the door and I was looking through the window and keeping an eye on the dog man that was up in the tree. And he finally started the truck and we drove out of our parking spot, got on the pond road. Well, the cat moved out of the way and he went over on the side of the bridge. And once we were getting down pond road, that cat took off running down the road the same direction as us and then he veered off and went into the brush on the side of the road but when i looked back and looked up in the tree i could just see this black figure shimmying its way down the tree not just too fast but he was moving fairly quickly more like you know just going to get out of the tree and probably go and see what the heck that we were doing he wasn't really in a rush to get down the tree and start chasing us down the road so we finally crested the little hill and I didn't see any more. And on the way back to Corey's house, I just started thinking about it. I was like, I'm pretty sure that was a dog man up in the tree. Because like I said, the size of that thing and the fact that I saw an arm and it was in a 60 foot tree, I'd highly doubt there was a person and it most definitely was not a bear and it wasn't a raccoon. So, of course, once we got back to the house, I kind of eased up on it and didn't talk to Alex or Corey about it, but Alex did have a weird look on his face for the rest of the night. He was just, he seemed uneasy and he didn't get too much sleep that night. So I think that in the back of his mind, he realized, you know, something was there that he didn't realize existed. So he was pretty shook up, but me, I was still pondering the fact that, you know, compared to my encounter in 2016, this was really not as terrifying. It was still scary, but not anywhere near as bad. Yeah, it could always be much worse. That's true. 
Before you saw that dog, man, were you thinking one might have been in the area at any time? Well, the only thing in the back of my mind was if there might have potentially been maybe another one or two or three or four, uh, an entire pack. But the one thing I was thinking about, I was thinking, well, since we were driving down the road and the animals seemed to really quiet down once the thing caught up with us, I thought, well, maybe there is a pack. Or maybe just another dog man that's with this one. But I think what's going on is they sent this one ahead of them as a scout. And he was just keeping an eye on us and seeing what we were doing. Because I'm sure that they were wondering why we were stopping and what we were doing in the water. And thinking, well, these guys might actually be potentially leaving food for us. So I think that's basically what they were so curious about. I think they probably were interested in getting some fish. That makes sense. It'd be an easy meal, no doubt about that. When you saw what looked like a dog man in that tree, why'd you take so much time getting out of there? Well, if you think about it like with any other predator that might be watching you, when something is making a huge hurry to get the hell out of Dodge, they usually would associate that with, oh god, my food, it's gonna be going. I probably better get down there and take care of it before I end up losing it. So I think that staying calm, and just gathering our things like that, we didn't know it was up there, was the better way of getting away from the dog man that was up in the tree. Because I'm sure if I pointed him out to Alex and he saw it, and if I showed Corey, then knowing those two, I guarantee they probably would have had their flashlights out and they would have went up onto the hill. And I don't think that would have been an experience those two would have wanted to have. Because I guarantee Alex probably would never go back in the woods again, and Corey probably would have had a panic attack, from what I know. Yeah, given those reasons, I can understand why you didn't tell them. How far was it from you when you first saw it? Up in the tree from where we were sitting, if you did an exact measurement from where I was, point A, to where he was up in the tree, point B, uh, I would say he was probably about 120 feet away. Okay, well, at least he wasn't right on top of you. Oh, no, he was definitely pretty far. Up in a 60-foot tree that was... It's a decent ways away. Well, that's good. If you're having an encounter, that's the kind to have. Do you think that dog man was in that tree the whole time you were there, or do you think it climbed that tree while you were there on the bank? I think he eventually made his way down to us after we left the first area that we were at on Coffee Road. So I think once we got there at the end of the road and got set up, he wasn't there yet. But since I wasn't paying attention to the hill or paying attention to basically when the animals went quiet. I think eventually when they did go quiet is when he arrived, and he shimmied up the tree as quietly as he could. And then he sat there for probably close to 30 or 40 minutes before I even noticed him. Yeah, that makes sense. They're definitely stealthy enough to do that. Not long after that happened to you, another dog man chased you down a road. What's the story behind that experience? Well, this was the following weekend that we had the encounter. And, of course, I was actually contemplating on going, and I got home from work, and, of course, as soon as I walked into my room, I was thinking, well, I might play some games tonight, but I was like, ah, nobody's online, so I figure I'll go do something else. Well, I was actually going to go outside and mess around with some of my old animal aquariums up in the garage. I was going to take them down and start getting stuff packed up for my move to my apartment. But as I was walking out, I noticed my dog man uh, investigator field manual was sitting on my bed because i was looking at it earlier and i said well you know what i'll drive down to coffee road tonight and do some investigating so of course i grabbed my book and i grabbed my uh, 44 magnum i got a ruger super blackhawk that my dad got me for christmas and of course i grabbed that put it in my holster and i took that with me and i ended up grabbing some snacks at the store filled the Jeep up with gas, and I drove about an hour down to my dad's woodlot that night. And I got on Coffee Road, and of course, I took my time driving down there and turned the radio down. And I went into that area where the hemlocks were, and I just sat there. I sat there for probably a good 45 minutes, I'd say. And I was jotting down some notes in my journal about the area and about the weekend before and what we heard that night and the things that we saw. And that's when I heard a howl. And it's like, as soon as I heard that, I was writing in my notebook. It just immediately sent shivers up my spine. I mean, it was just instant. As soon as I heard that, it scared the 
absolute out of me. And what really scared me is the fact that it's like I came down here by myself tonight and I didn't realize what I was getting myself into. But I was like, ah, well, I got the doors locked. I'm in a Jeep. You know, it's like I don't think that they're going to bother me too much. So I got my phone. I was getting it ready. I just turned it on. I was getting into my camera to record sound in the video part. And, of course, I heard another howl. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I got to get this thing going. So finally I got my video recorder up. And, of course, it was pitch black, so you can't see anything in the vehicle. And nothing happened. So, of course, I put my phone down. I was resting it on my arm. And I was just listening, and I had my finger on the record button. And I was sitting there. And, of course, luckily, that's when the howl started. And I just hit the record button. And I just left it on my arm. I didn't want to make too much noise. I ended up getting some noises on the recording rubbing against my uh, jacket. But, anyways, uh, I got about four seconds of that howl. And the howl stopped, of course, and I listened again. I was hoping to get a, at least a longer one or a better, more clear howl, and I didn't hear anything. And that's about 10 minutes later, I heard something walking through the woods because I could hear it when I had my window cracked. It was on the left side, on the driver's side. And it was walking through the hemlocks, through the leaves, because you could distinctly hear it. I mean, the hemlock forest that's there, there's always dead leaves on the ground. Because the area barely gets touched by either snow or rain or wind. So the leaves can't really blow out of there any time of the year. They just sit there and collect from year to year. And I could hear it walking in my direction. And when I heard it, it was definitely a quadruped. It was not walking on two legs by any means. And of course, I started thinking, maybe it's a deer. But with the howls being probably two or three hundred yards away, I was starting to think, well, it couldn't be a deer then. So, of course, I started the Jeep up, and I was like, ah, I'm going to start driving down the road. So I started getting down the road. I drove past our camp, and I was going down the second hill. And I was heading to an area that me and a lot of the family has come up with. They just call it Grandpa's Scrapyard. He dumps a bunch of metal scraps there. He's got a whole bunch of old engines. There's junk that we have dumped off there before years and years and years ago. It's mostly just metal scraps from the old camp that was there. There's actually older stuff there that farmers, when they lived there during the 1930s and 40s, dropped off. Just as I was getting to that area, I looked in the rearview mirror, and I noticed something on the road. And at first, I didn't think much of it because I was thinking, ah, my eyes are playing tricks on me. And then I looked again, and I noticed something trotting on the road behind me. But, of course, it was about maybe 50 or 60 yards away behind me. And, of course, the moon was not very bright. It was only a crescent moon that night, so you didn't get very much light. So I could just see it with my brake lights. So I would tap the brakes, and that's when I noticed the eye shine. I saw the two eyes, and then I distinctly saw one of the back legs as we were going around the corner. Because as he was turning the corner that I'd already just passed, his body was actually turning as he was going around. So I could see his backside. And that's when I noticed the backward canine-type legs. And, of course... When I saw that, I was like, this is definitely not a deer. That's got to be a dog, man. But he wasn't really chasing. He was just kind of like keeping pace with me. He was trotting. He wasn't in a big rush to get up on the Jeep. But I had this thing in the back of my mind. I was like, you know what? I'm going to test something. So I stopped the Jeep. And as soon as I stopped, he stopped. And he just sat there. And I could see his eyes reflecting the brake lights because I saw my foot on the brake. And then I'd start driving again. And then he'd start trotting behind me and following me. And he just kept trotting down the road behind me. And I actually just got down to the sluice pipe where we were fishing the weekend before. Drove past that. And I was just getting into another patch of really thick hardwood forest. And I stopped again. And he stopped. And that's when I heard something off to my left coming through the trees that was paralleling me. And at that moment, I was thinking, you're holy there's something following me. It's paralleling me on the side. So I was thinking there might be a pack of these things following me. And this one in the back is just telling me to make sure that I don't try and, you know, if I want to get go into reverse to get away from these things and turn around. So, of course, I figured, ah, well, I'll just keep driving and see what he does. And I kept an eye out my window. And, of course, I kept my brights on, too, because they brightened up everything out in the front, even to the sides. The Jeep's got really weird lights, so you can even see stuff out to your left and right. And it was illuminating the forest a little bit. So I was keeping an eye out. And I could hear it walking through the trees. It was still paralleling me. It wasn't moving very fast. It was just trotting just like the other one. 
and I was going down the road a little bit more and I started thinking, I was like, you know, I want to kick myself in the butt right now because when I was working that past summer, I was actually looking at getting a thermal camera for my iPhone because when David Jones posted a video on the NADP website for equipment and he said a thermal camera is like one of the best things that you can have. And I literally had my eyes on one. It was not super expensive. It was like, I think it was one ninety nine ninety nine on the Apple website. They call it the FLIR 1. I think they got a FLIR 2 out now. It's like 300 bucks, but it's a really good thermal imager. I mean, I saw videos on it, hunters using it, and it can pick up thermal images quite nice. And I ended up not buying it. I don't know why I didn't do it. But at the same time, I was sitting there thinking, if I would have bought that, I could have been using that right now to see whatever is in the woods and actually could have got some videos of what was following me on the side and what was following me to the rear. And then it struck me as, well, I think I'm just going to get the out of Dodge. So I kind of sped up a little bit. And the one that was following me, he kind of picked up speed and was starting to come up to the rear of the uh, Jeep. But he was staying just out of the brake lights because I'm pretty sure he didn't want to be spotted. I'm assuming he probably did not think that I saw him. But eventually I got to the end of the road. I pulled up onto Pond Road. And once I got on the pavement, I gunned it and I was going down the road. And that's when the one that was following me stopped at the very end of Coffee Road, right where the pavement starts. And just as I was looking in the rearview mirror, I could see him, distinctly see him, stand up on two legs. And he lifted his head up and looked like he was sniffing. And then I crested the hill, and that was the last I saw of them. Do you have any opinions on why they were following you the way they did that night? Part of me thinks that it was just curiosity. And another part was thinking, well, these could be the same part of the same ones that saw us last weekend. So maybe they're thinking they could be associating the vehicle with food again. They might have possibly smelt my fishing gear that was in the back because I did have a lot of my gear with me. And I actually had a rag that was in my tackle box that kind of smelled like bullhead so there's a chance that when it wafted out the window they could have smelled this so they could be associating it with food still but another part of me thinks that the one that was paralleling me there's a quite a good possibility that maybe they're hoping that i would have to turn around on the road and when i stop to turn around they might have taken opportunity to attack the vehicle and possibly get the nice juicy morsel that was in the driver's seat <laughs> Ew, that's a creepy thought you mentioned the howls you recorded. I want to play that recording for the listeners, but before I do, is there anything else you'd like to share with them about that? If anybody has ever seen the movie Ginger Snaps, not really the first or second movie, the third one, Ginger Snaps, the beginning, where they're stuck, I think it's like the 1800s, they're in a fort that's besieged by werewolves. Well, there's a part where they're walking through the woods when they hear these werewolves start to like howl. Well, they're werewolves in the movie. They have like, it's not really a howl. It's like a moan. The howl that I heard sounded just like the ones in the movie. I mean, if you were to play them side by side, they sound exactly the same, which is what really creeped me out. Yeah, that is a really good movie. And I know what you mean. That was a really creepy scene. All right, let's play that recording for the listeners now. Let's play that again. Let's play that one more time. If that howling doesn't make the hair in your butt stand up, you don't scare easily. That's pretty creepy. Oh yeah, that will send shivers down your spine. When I heard that, part of me was telling me to hit the gas and get the out of Dodge. <laughs> oh, I'll bet. When that dogman was following you, was it trying to gain on you at any time, or did it stay the same distance away from you? He stayed a decent ways back. He wasn't interested in getting too, too close. Because, I mean, the brake lights are actually pretty bright on the vehicle, and he wanted to stay out of them as best as he could. So I think part of it was just curiosity. 
So he kept his distance and didn't want me to see him or thought I didn't see him, even though I did. Yeah, that does make sense. That just might be what was going on. How sure are you that the noises you heard in the bush were being caused by another dog man? Well, it was definitely a quadruped. That's what it sounded like. Even when I'm driving on the gravel, I wasn't going too, too fast. And the vehicle is not loud by any means. So I could definitely hear it in the woods. But the sound that it was making when I was walking, it sounded like it was walking about the same speed, the same pace as the one that was behind me. And, I mean, I don't really think it would be anything other than a dog man because with one literally about 50 yards in back of me, I don't think a deer would want to be anywhere near the area with one of those in there because I'm pretty sure he would have just ignored me and went after a potential meal, you know, if there was a deer there. Even a bear, I'm sure they would probably go after a black bear with no problem. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they did. I'm sure anything in the forest is fair game for them. I guess we'll never know for sure, but when you look at how big they get and all their weaponry, I'm sure they'll take down anything they come across. Oh, definitely. <laughs> how did the dogman you saw last year compare to the one you saw in 2016? Surprisingly, the ones that I saw the weekend we were fishing and the weekend after when I went up there and investigated, they did not seem anywhere near as intimidating as the one that I saw. I mean, I didn't get details of their face or their body structure other than, you know, the canine type legs and the way that their arms were when he walked. Because when I looked at him in the light, the brake lights, when he was walking, you could distinctly see that he had fingers. There was no doubt about it. I mean, I wish I could have stopped to actually get a little bit better look at him. I had a flashlight with me. I could have pointed it out back, but I'd rather not shine a light into his eyes or try to get any details on him and end up angering him because I'm sure, well, anything that gets a flashlight shine in their face is not going to appreciate that very much. But the one that I saw, like I said, he looked really distinctly just like the werewolf from Bad Moon. So he was incredibly intimidating. He was a lot bulkier too than these ones. These ones were a little bit scrawnier, so to say. But of course, this was during the summer, so it could have been lack of food or possibly just a lot of the hair that they had on them might have shed so that they wouldn't get too overheated. Of all the movie werewolves the dog man could look like, the one from Bad Moon, that's about as bad as it can get. Yeah, that is one ugly looking werewolf. I mean, as long as I don't run into something that looks like the one from American Werewolf in London, then I think I'll be fine with that. But <laughs> the one from Bad Moon is still pretty terrifying. It sure is. It obviously takes a lot to freak you out, but not long ago, something happened that did exactly that. Please tell us about that. Well, this, what happened recently really gave me an uneasy feeling. It creeped me out. I was, all I could do was just, I, I started thinking about it every single night. Couldn't get it out of my mind as to what was going on, but my dad recently posted a picture and a video on Facebook. He recently just bought a 375 H&H &H mag. Well, knowing him, he doesn't just go out and outright buy a gun just for the sake of buying it because he wants to shoot it. He's pretty stingy on that stuff. It's like if there's a gun that you shoot expensive ammunition out of, he generally tries to stay away from it because he's not really a big fan of going out and just shooting for the sake of shooting. I mean, he'll go to the range, but he'll usually go and shoot his pistol or his guns that have cheap ammunition. He likes to reload, but he's just not the shooting type of guy that most of my family is. He likes to get his guns that he likes to shoot that are cheap, or he'll go and get like collector's ones, you know, old vintage World War II guns, World War I guns, but he won't really shoot them. But I was looking at the prices of a 375 H&H mag, and they're fairly pricey for the rounds. But he was talking about it online on Facebook with somebody else, and he said, hey, you just got some cheap Alaskan rounds. And he said that he was starting to reload them as well. I guess he got a reloading set from a friend of his. And, of course, when he posted that, the only thing going through my mind was, why in the would he buy a 375 H&H &H mag if he's not really keen on going out and shooting it? Well, the video of him, he, when they shot it, he was just shooting some reloaded rounds that he did himself. But they didn't shoot it very much. They only shot a couple of rounds through it, and that was it. And I started thinking about it. I was like, well, he's not going to hunt deer with that. You're not going to hunt deer with a safari gun. The thing is designed to kill Cape Buffalo, you know, up to, you know, medium-sized African big game. And it finally clicked in my head. I was like, what if he bought that gun to kill something at the woodlot that spooked him? 
And that was the only thing in my mind. I was like, he must have seen something up there for him to go and outright buy a 375 H&H mag, which they're not only super expensive themselves, the ammo is expensive, but he just wouldn't outright go and buy it just for some giggles, so to say. So, of course, that really, really creeped me out because I thought, what if he's seen something up there? But what else freaked me out was when we went to my grandparents, went down there for dinner last week, and he was talking about it with my grandfather. But when my grandfather asked him why he got it, he kind of just, well, yeah, I just I wanted to buy it and blah, blah, blah. And when he gave that typical statement, uh, that seems like, well, it's just an excuse to tell him why he bought it. It didn't seem like that was the reason why he bought the gun. And he was kind of white in complexion when he said it. And he just didn't look, he looked very uneasy. And that's what really creeped me out. Cause I was like, I think he saw something. Cause he seemed a little bit spooked when he said it. And you could sense that he was kind of lying about it when he told my grandfather why he got the gun. And it just creeped me that after that, because I realized, you know, what if he saw what I saw or what? I mean, even during this past hunting season, what if he ended up coming face to face with one? And then when those thoughts started to go through my mind, I was thinking about it. I was like, when do you think other people are going to start seeing this thing? I was like, what if somebody ends up going missing in that area? I mean, there's homes there and they're few and far between, but I'm just starting to think that there's some people up there that might end up going missing and. I thought about my father and I was like, well, I hope he doesn't go out into the woods and start hunting this thing because I might all of a sudden get a call one day that, you know, hey, he went missing. He, he didn't come home. And then they end up calling the cops and get a search party out there. And then like your typical horror story, I wouldn't want to end up having that call to go down there and they say, yeah, we found him or what was left of him because that would certainly stir the pot and shake up probably all of St. Lawrence County if that happened. Oh, I'm sure it would. You just mentioned the possibility of people going missing. Two hunters were reported as having gone missing not too far from where you live. How much can you tell us about that? Um, I was actually reading an article last summer when I was working. When they went missing, it wouldn't be this past hunting season. It'd be the season before, so it'd be the fall of 2015. I guess two hunters were reported missing over in the Adirondacks. They didn't give any names. I guess one of them was found. And they said that he was partially devoured from what I heard. Um, the exact location they didn't give, they didn't mention too many details like most other animal attacks. They just said, you know, he might have been mauled by a black bear. And the other guy, they still have not found him yet. And it's going close to two years now that they haven't found him. And I haven't really seen any information on the news or about it or anything else. But the other interesting thing that I saw was a third person, which this guy was found. So it was a 77 year old. This was over in Delaware County and he was reported missing. And of course, the only information they gave was there's no foul play. And of course, they didn't give details on how he died. But from what I was reading on another article, they said that he was mauled. And that's the only detail that they actually gave about what happened. So they didn't say anything about an animal or a bear possibly attacking the guy and killing him. But I'm hoping that I find information from somebody that lives there, maybe a family member, that maybe I can get some more info on what happened to them or if they've had any other issues with missing hunters. But I have heard some tales around Wanakina and like Cranberry Lake. I'm supposed to go up there probably the spring or summer. A uh, family member of mine, they've told me that there have been missing people there before they actually talked about the 1930s and 40s when they're working on the railroads up there there were actually a lot of guys that ended up going missing while they're working on that there were a couple of what they call animal attacks up there and i'm hoping to go down there and get some more information on it. she's actually got some news articles that i can hopefully get i'm gonna plan on sending them either to uh, jody cook or david jones and then probably send some information your way if that hunter had been mauled, the authorities would have been able to tell if it was a natural predator or something else. Not that they would ever tell the public if it was an unknown predator, of course, that killed him, but they would still know. Yeah, I mean, like with the stories there of missing people, like, I mean, a lot of the episodes, like the ones I've listened to before, when they talk about the LBL murder, they're always blamed on something else. I mean, I know a lot of people with the LBL case, they, um... Didn't really mention a bear or anything else. I know there's a couple websites that they kind of irritated me a little bit. They were talking about uh, a cougar doing it. And they said, though, there's no way that these dog man believers think it was a dog man. 
But it's like, well, last I knew, a cougar isn't going to go into somebody's mobile home and rip apart an entire family and then a, drag out their little girl, drag her up into a tree, and devour her up there. Oh, there's no doubt. It was really frustrating as sometimes I'd swear the authorities don't expect people to use common sense when they release these statements. It's obvious that it wasn't a cougar that did that. Yeah, I wish they would be a little bit more informative about it, but then again, I can see why they probably don't want to, oh, you know, this person, they got killed by a werewolf in their own home. It's like everybody needs to grab their guns and pitchforks and torches and go out in the woods and find it and kill it. That would probably not be a good idea. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, I don't blame them for not telling the truth. It's just, I wish they would give the public more credit for common sense. Back to talking about your dad. Has he ever shared his thoughts on dogmen with you? He's not big into the paranormal. He's kind of a religious guy, but I don't think in terms of like ghosts and the paranormal, Bigfoot and that, he doesn't believe in that stuff. But at the same time, I don't think he would really tell me anything about it. If he knew that there's something dangerous at the woodlot, he probably wouldn't tell me too much about it. He'd probably go and try to handle the situation himself, which is what scares me. Because, I mean, I know him. He will literally take time out of his day to go and do something, you know, that he deems necessary to get done. And when it comes to something dangerous, I guarantee he would be up there in a heartbeat to go and track down something that might potentially hurt someone, which might not end up very good on his part. Well, I hope nothing like that happens. Since he bought that 375, he just might believe in Dogman now. Oh, I wouldn't doubt it. If he saw something like that, I mean, there's even a possibility he might have shot at one. But, I mean, if he's got something that big, I mean, if he did shoot it, then I'm sure he would probably do some damage, but that's dependent on if he was able to see it before it got him. Yeah, which, that's a crapshoot right there. You say a lot of weird things have been happening around his house. What kinds of things have been happening? Well, I mean, apart from the howls, there's been times where uh, things have actually come up to the house and jiggled the doorknob at night. Uh, I was actually home one night during Christmas when it happened. And I don't know if I mentioned it to you, I, uh, there were footprints outside. They were huge paw prints. My dad assumed it was a bear. He thought the bear came up and was like hitting the doorknob with its snout. But this was back when I was in high school. He looked at the footprints. I looked at the footprints. They were definitely canine and they were too big to be any kind of dog or wolf. And they definitely weren't bear. I mean, I, I know my tracks from just from what he's taught me and all the research I've done online for classes and that. But it was definitely not a bear. So that's what was really freaky. But apart from around the house and the woodlot, it's mostly been the howls, and there have been a lot of reports lately of dogs going missing and cats. Mostly cats, though. A lot of the cats in the area are stray. They come from farms because the farmers, they just let their cats breed like crazy. And the cats usually rummage around the town or they rummage around out in the woods. And their population was actually pretty high. There, You'd see feral cats everywhere. And just all of a sudden, their population just dwindled. It just went down gone no more <laughs> you'd see one once in a while but the feral cat population was just all but pretty much done you just see domestic cats but there was also people saying their household cats have gone missing and there's even reports of larger dogs going missing we don't know for sure it was a dog man or dog men that were responsible for taking out all those cats but dog men are really hard on cats i wouldn't be surprised if it was a dog man or a dog men that had been doing that i agree 100 percent. it's got to be a dog man i mean i know that in the area we have owls that'll come in and attack cats once in a while we actually had one come in our yard and attempt to kill one of our cats one year but i mean they haven't really been around this year and i haven't really heard too much around this area about cats going missing because of owls but with the dogs that have been going missing i mean they've found some of the carcasses out back in the woods and when they find them they're pretty torn apart in fact one of the I think because my mom heard about it a couple weeks ago. Some old lady lost her German Shepherd. And when they found it, it was just completely torn apart. But the creepy thing about it was it was dragged up into a tree and it was in the crotch of the tree. And like its legs were kind of dangling down out of the tree, just hanging on by the tendons. And the thing is, the area I'm in, there are absolutely no mountain lions. You won't see them. You won't hear them. The only time you're going to see one is if you go up to Wanakina or Cranberry Lake. But down here, you'll never see one. 
There's just the amount of people that are down here and the amount of hunters. They will avoid this place at all costs. Did they ever say if the dog was almost totally consumed or was it just barely fed upon? About 90% of the body was pretty much hollowed out. The head was still kind of intact, but the rest of the body was just mostly the tendons and that that were attached to the legs. Some of the legs were completely torn off. They were just laying on the ground. But for the most part, the dog was completely torn apart. Just bits and pieces of it hanging in the tree. Wow, that's not good. After you came on the show for the first time and talked about the human remains you and your friend found that time, a lot of people wondered why you didn't report it to local authorities. What do you have to say about that? It kind of angered me for a second there because it's like, well, I wasn't very old when that happened. And for the most part, when we look at it, when I was that young, I wasn't really big on, you know, human anatomy. So I didn't really know if it was human or not. So there's a possibility it might not have been human. But at the same time, when my friend Curtis was inside that little beaver hut, he said that they looked human. And he was about three or four years older than me at the time. So he was a lot wiser than me, so to say. And he actually has seen human remains. When they did a dig over, actually, it was on Coffee Road, actually. A lot of the farmers that were there used to bury their dead. And there's actually a graveyard there. And they had a group of archaeologists come up there and they were digging around. And uh, they pulled up some old human bones. And he said they looked just like him, you know, but he wasn't 100 percent sure. So when people were going nuts about it, I was like, well, I wasn't sure what was going on. He wasn't probably going to say anything. You know, he was pretty freaked out. But at the same time, this was many, many years ago. And nature being as nature is, the land was pretty much completely changed over, you know, a period of three or four years by the water back there because Ducks Unlimited came back there and they dug out the creek that was back there. So basically when it flooded, Where that beaver hut was, the water and the ice, when it came in early spring, when the snow was starting to melt, completely destroyed it and then washed it away. So any chance of doing that nowadays, there's no chance of seeing any of the evidence that was there. It's all completely washed away. Well, it's easy to say if you were put in that situation, you'd react a certain way. But until you find yourself in that situation, you never really know how you are going to respond. That is just so hard to deal with. Oh, definitely. I mean... Nowadays, if I would have found that, oh my God, I would have been going straight to, you know, the tribal police and reporting it. But of course, then again, back then, I was just a little stinker, so I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's understandable. All right, Dave, it's about time for us to get out of here. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, me being me, I carry a sidearm with me, carried my 44, and it did give me a sense of security. Not saying it's going to do anything to a dog man, but if you go out by yourself, make sure your doors are locked. You know, if you got a decent vehicle and you're driving down, like, say, dirt roads and that, just make sure that you don't open your window all the way because there's a chance something, if your window's all the way down, something's going to reach in and grab you. But that's only if they feel hostile. But anyways, if you're going out, just keep your wits about you. Crack your windows, listen, keep an eye out behind you, check your rearview mirror. Just keep an eye out. 360 degree, you just keep your head on a swivel, but make sure that you're careful when you're driving as well. Or if you're out, just going out in person, if you're walking in the woods, I highly recommend you bring somebody with you. At least another person or two or three other people and have the right equipment. Well, that sounds like great advice to me. Well, thanks for coming on the show and sharing those experiences with us, Dave. You know, I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me again, Vic. Oh, you know, you're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. You too. Thank you. Thanks. We'll see ya. Bye. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.